Hi, and welcome to Crazy Like a Fox, using Redis as your primary and only database. My name is Eric Brandis, and I run two different software companies. The first is TrackJS, which is a JavaScript error monitoring service, and the second we're going to talk more about today is called Request Metrics. It's a real user performance monitoring tool that uses only Redis as its database. Prior to that, I spent 12 years as an enterprise software consultant, toiling in the bowels of the Fortune 500, where I learned a lot about how to write software, but maybe even more about how not to write software. As I mentioned, the purpose of this talk today is to dig in a little bit and kind of a case study about how we built request metrics using Redis as the only database. I only have 20 minutes, so I don't have time to get really deep into anything. So if you're interested in how it's built, check out this link where we recorded hours of us writing code, deliberating, and having technical discussions, which we've then edited down, so that you can get a fully transparent look into how this product was actually built from the ground up. Before we get into more details, I want to talk about why I love Redis. As a business founder and the chief tech person at these businesses, when the pager goes off, it's my job to fix whatever's wrong. And one of the things I love about Redis is that Redis almost never causes the pager to go off. It has very low operational complexity and overhead. It rarely surprises and it's battle hardened. Uh, other things I like about Redis are that almost any programming language can talk to it. There's a lot of flexible data types. And perhaps most importantly, Redis is blazing fast. Common use cases for that speed include level two caching, read through caching, transient data storage of other kinds but mainly caching. Because everyone knows the one thing you should never do with Redis is use it as your primary database. And that's because Redis is not a database in the traditional sense. It has some limitations. Number one, most of the data lives in memory. There are options to persist the data to disk, but durability is async and best effort. Uh, there are limited transactional guarantees. The fact that the data is all in memory is great for speed, but it's not great if you have terabytes or petabytes of data. You have to have as much RAM as you have data in order for Redis to be an option. And in most cases, that's just not feasible. Also, there's no relational, relational capability with Redis, meaning there's you know, no foreign key constraints, referential integrity, that sort of thing. And your querying is limited to read, reading keys or parts of keys. So there's no SQL, there's no joining, there's no selects, there's no anything like that. But because Redis is so fast and because the operational complexity is so low, what if you wanted to see if you could build an actual product using only Redis? And we did it. And it's called Request Metrics, and it's a real user monitoring performance tool. And what that means is, you install a little JavaScript snippet on your site, and as your users interact with your page, we're watching how fast the page really loaded for them, or how fast those endpoints are returning data, and we're shipping it to our service where we aggregate it for you and give you a nice UI. Here's an example. So this is actually running on TrackJS, my other product. We've got the little JavaScript agent installed, and so every time a user loads a page, we get the timings for that user. And so here you can see we draw pretty graphs with median, 75th and 95th percentile. We've got the number of unique users. And we have other things too, like we'll monitor the web vitals, which is a new metric that Google is tracking for SEO purposes. The reason I show you these screenshots is just to give you an idea of what the tool looks like, the kind of data we store. And just to think about, we use Redis to drive this entire UI, which might seem crazy, but I'll get a little bit more into uh, the data model later. Okay, so sure, you can build a product using only Redis, but that, I mean, but why, right? It's, it's sort of a fool's errand, isn't it? Well, for us, one of the big reasons is speed. Not only as a performance tool do we want our website to be fast, it's a bad look if your performance tool is slow to use. But the other reason we need speed is because our customers are sending us loads of data. So every time a customer has a page load, that's at least one, if not more, requests to our service. So if we have a busy customer that gets 10 million page views an hour, that's 10 million plus requests coming at us per hour. So we need a backend that's capable of very, very fast speeds. Now, the reason we like Redis is because it simplifies our architecture. Redis is fast by default. We can keep a master and a replica, and we're good to go. This also keeps costs low. We don't need nine distributed machines to handle this right work through. So we can have a smaller number of machines, which keeps our costs down, which keeps our customers' costs down. 
And finally, for us, the durability limitations of Redis are not a huge issue. We're doing performance metric aggregation. We don't store individual performance events. We roll them up into minute or hour or day chunks. So if we lose a couple, it's not the end of the world. This is not mission critical data. I want to briefly touch on the architecture of request metrics, just so you can see where Redis fits into the pieces of the puzzle. So there is a JavaScript agent that our customers would put on their site. And as a page load occurs, the agent wakes up and collects all the different timing information and sends it back to our service, where Nginx sits at the front door handling all requests. We want to keep things fast and speedy, so we don't write to Redis right away. All we have Nginx do is take that post body, that JSON data that the agent sent, and it just spits it right to a log file. Nginx is super good at writing custom JSON log files very, very quickly. We then have a processor, which we write in .NET Core on, on Linux, um, takes all those log files and every few seconds parses through them, aggregating all that data into little minute time slices and shoves it into Redis. We have other jobs that run alerts and emails and things like that. And we also have a reporting UI that reads directly from Redis, which again, I'll talk about a little bit more later. But as you can see, the only database here is Redis. All of this runs on only two bare metal servers. We are not cloud people. We are bare metal people. Maybe it's due to age, maybe it's due to something else, but we really enjoy the flexibility that bare metal hardware gives us. The amount of performance you get for the price is really great. So we have two of these servers. One is the master, the other is a replica. They're both Xeons with eight logical cores, and each one has a one gigabit per second network pipe to the public internet and a two gigabit per second uh, VLAN between them. And because this is a newer product and we weren't sure what the demand was gonna look like, we only bought 64 gigabyte RAM boxes, which means the maximum store size we can have is functionally probably around you know, 48 gigs of data. Uh, we could get bigger boxes, and if the need to scale out arises, we certainly will. Uh, Request Metrics was launched last year, so it's still a fairly new product. However, we've got quite a few customers sending us a lot of data. Um, just in the last 30 days, we've had 1.8 billion ingest requests to the Nginx front door. That equates to about 700 requests per second um, all the time. Of that, 125 million page views or web vital records came in and 7.5 billion endpoint timings. It's worth noting that a single ingest request can contain multiple pages or endpoints or web vitals or other things. Um, at peak, if we were to force the system to you know, work at max performance, it can do about 40,000 timings per second ingested. Uh, fortunately, we're only doing about 700 per second right now, uh, and our average CPU is only about 6%. And we do this all on two commodity physical machines that each one only costs us $150 a month. So let's talk a little bit about performance and writing data to Redis and all of that. This chart on the right here is our timings for our processing step, where we read the JSON log files that Nginx spits out, merge them all together and kind of create a big stats bundle and ship that to Redis. So this green time here is the amount of time that we spent writing to Redis in milliseconds. And this blue time is how much time we spent write, or reading JSON, deserializing JSON in milliseconds. As you can see, even though we're using the fastest JSON parser available for .NET Core, which is called UTF-8 JSON, the JSON deserialization of these log files accounts for about 10 times more time than actually writing to Redis. It just goes to show you a little bit about how fast Redis is. Now we have two machines, master and replica. Both of those are processing their own log files. So in order to not tromp each other, we actually had to write our own distributed lock mechanism to make sure that you know when box A is writing, box B doesn't write and vice versa. Uh, and just finally, the Redis time is usually less than 30 milliseconds per cycle to process this sort of thing, which is pretty amazing. Now, as far as the performance data itself, right? So we've got this log parser and he's shipping all this data in aggregate to Redis. But how do we actually store it in Redis? So here's an example page for a single URL. This is the kind of data you'd see for an individual page. And in this case, it's the home page of our TrackJS application. So, We've got a bunch of page performance statistics. 
We've got a bunch of geographic statistics, page load breakdown, and there's web vitals and other things below this. We've got the kind of browser and all sorts of things. So we've got a lot of great data here. How do we, use, how do we store this? How do we keep it small? Well, each page and endpoint has its own key in Redis. And as I said before, all of the data is aggregated, which means we don't store individual uh, data points. So whether you have 10 requests in a minute or 1,000 requests in a minute for a certain page, it's going to result in a single uh, interval inside Redis. Um, and as the data gets older, we actually back that granularity off. So we're not storing minute data for 90 days. Um, after a certain point, we'll roll it to hourly data and then eventually day data. Because for our use case and our customer's use case, what you really want to see at 90 days or 180 days is just trends over time. So to store an actual piece of data, uh, we've got to find the key for it. So in this case, you know, the, the page is my.trackjs.com. And so the key for it looks like the, your customer ID, your application ID, because you can have multiple applications in a given account. It's a page, so we've got this clever little P delimiter. And then rather than use the URL, we actually use Murmur 3 to hash the URL so that we have a consistently length um, string that we can use. So that way, you know, if there's a long URL or a short URL, it doesn't matter. It's always the same size. So we've got this URL hash. And so this is the real key for this data in our system. Now, if you go to that key, you'll find a hash. And the hash has many fields that have computed field names. And it's the interval. And then when does that interval start? And I'll show you more in just a second. And then each field has a value, and that value is a JSON blob. So let's look at an example. So here's that same key, right? So I ran H keys on this guy to get all the different fields. Here's some examples. So we've got day or hour or minute. And so that's the length of that roll up of that period. And then here is the Unix timestamp in milliseconds of when that period starts. And over here, this is an example of just one of the values that you'd find at one of those fields. So we've got the interval, we've got the period start, counts, durations, all sorts of other data. And you can see here that we've, we've tried to shrink the JSON property names to be as small as possible because remember, our biggest limitation really is the storage size based on the amount of RAM we have on the box. And we do some other things to keep storage smaller. We use a special .NET hyperlog log counter to keep the unique counts small. We've got a custom format that we serialize the geo data as, which after much trial and error, we sort of settled on it in terms of uh, ease of use to size trade-offs. But this is, this is the kind of data that we actually store where the rubber meets the road. So when we go to read that data, because we're using Redis, we just read it all every time. We're very naive about how we do it. There's no special querying. We read it all and we sort it in the app. So for example, here is a listing page where you can see all of your performance data rolled up into one. So this is all the pages in your application and we roll it up to give you an overall view of the, the load time and, and any of these other uh, statistics. To build this page, we might read up to a thousand keys per request to draw it, but it's really fast. And to take pressure off the master, we only read from the replica for a lot of this performance data because dirty reads are okay. The Redis replication stream is very fast. And at most, you're maybe a second or two behind, which when you're talking about 30 days of data is not a problem. Um, I will say that at least in .NET land, uh, the only thing to mention is you want to be careful about how parallelized you get in terms of your reads. It looks like you should be able to go as wide as you want with the task parallel library, but in practice, actually, we found some issues. Um, again, just to, to finish talking about querying, the way we set up the data is that all of the data for a given page lives under a certain key. So to draw the data for a specific page or endpoint, all we have to do is an H get all against that key and we're good to go. So it's really quite simple. Um, the only other thing I want to call out as far as data model goes, and again, I don't have a lot of time, but we literally store every single thing in Redis, which means we also have a bunch of the normal kind of stuff you'd see in a database. We've got a user's key and a customer's key and all that kind of ancillary data that you store. And mostly what we use is hashes with uh, JSON values as the, you know, the value. And it works really great. It's really fast. Um, so for example, here's like a user record in the system. So you know, I get the user key 
And then if I wanna know, for example, which customer that user belongs to, we've got the relationship right here in the JSON. Which actually brings me to my next point. Redis is, I mean, at best considered a NoSQL style database, which means there is no relationship. So that relationship between customer and user and application, that's all managed in application code. Now that brings up some issues. Checking referential integrity at runtime can be expensive or add complexity to your code. So we don't do it. We just assume it's right. And every so often we run what we call an orphan hunter job to find dereferenced um, zombie or garbage data and either fix it or throw it away. And so that way it keeps our app code really simple and we kind of hide all that complexity in this one job that runs every so often, which has been a great trade-off for us. We really haven't run into uh, any major issues yet. Uh, a few other things to touch on, uh, administrative. Uh, so we use various Redis GUIs to take a look inside of our Redis database. VS Code has some nice extensions. We'll use Redis Desktop Manager. And we do have some bespoke admin pages as well to get a, you know, a picture of which customers take up the most size and that kind of thing. To access our dev and prod environments, we use SSH tunneling. For backups, of course, that's you know when you've got durability limitations like Redis does, backups are very important. We take a backup every hour. And it's literally just the dump RDB file. And we just store that in, in cloud storage. We actually store it in two different clouds, just in case. Uh, it's the only thing we use the cloud for. And uh, a lot of people will tell you that backups are worthless unless you actually try them from time to time, and I agree. And so we restore our prod backups to dev every hour, which is nice from a dev perspective. We've always got fresh data. Um, a lot of people are gonna ask about Redis cluster. You know, I'm talking a lot about master replica. That's old, right? Everybody's using Redis cluster now. Well, um, like I mentioned earlier, I've used a lot of different databases and um, distributed databases in general, things like Elasticsearch. I find they take a lot more care and feeding and have a lot more complex failure modes. And so Redis cluster was a little too close to that for us. And so we decided to use master replica because it's simple conceptually and it doesn't take very much hardware. Um, we also like to use the different logical databases inside of Reddit uh, just to keep our data segmented in ways that make sense for us. And Redis cluster doesn't support multiple databases. Uh, in terms of uptime checking, how do we know if our cluster is up? Well, obviously Sentinel is a thing that exists, but for us, again, the complexity and the amount of infrastructure required was just too high for the value added. Instead, we just host an API, a status check API, and we have a third party uptime checker hit it. And if it can't hit that API and get the response it expects, it you know pages us. And finally, we don't use PubSub for anything because I've never really understood the point of PubSub in Redis. It's always felt a little bit separate. And obviously if your use case supports it, that's great, but you know it's just not anything we use. We primarily just use hashes and JSON. Uh, so my final thoughts on this, and the reason I really wanted to do this talk was just to, to let people know that it's possible. You can build an entire product with paying customers on Redis alone. And there are some advantages, like the speed. Now, there are also limitations. So before going into something crazy like this, you're going to want to understand the limitations of the tool and make sure that for your use case, those limitations aren't going to be a deal breaker. But for us, overall, the benefits outweigh the costs. Uh, and by quite a lot, you know, particularly when you factor in that administrative overhead, uh, the simplicity of the architecture. Boy, it's been really great so far. Um, for us, we found that really Redis is usually not the problem. The only issues we've really had have been with .NET Core and the Task Parallel Library or with the Stack Exchange Redis client, which they appear to make changes to all the time, and those changes appear to only cause more problems. So anyways, overall, it's been pretty great. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Hopefully this was interesting. Um, I know I had to go fast. It was kind of a very high level talk. If you have any questions about how we do things, we're very transparent, sort of an open book. Uh, like I said, we've got all those videos on YouTube about us actually writing the code for this. But if you have specific questions, please email me. I'm happy to answer. Thank you.